Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I have returned to Kerbal Space Program to do a little bit of space history. This is a Kerbalized clone of the Star Raker, and that's a that's a basically a single stage to orbit aircraft, which was conceived in the 1960s and later reinvestigated in detail in the 1970s. So this was uh, from Rockwell, who ultimately built the Space Shuttle Orbiter. This design obviously didn't become the Space Shuttle Orbiter, but later in the 1970s, the US was very interested in the possibility of building a network of 60 giant solar power satellites in space. And Star Raker was conceived as a vehicle that could make that happen. Uh, something that could launch to space, drop off cargo, or return and keep flying. So anyway, a lot of this episode is actually going to be based around a blog post by David S. Portry, who I've admired for a long time. He's been really good at uh, doing space history. Whenever I do space history, I inevitably find blog posts by him on the exact subject. I'm sure he'd appreciate it if you backed him on Patreon, because this is pretty much his main job. So yes, in October of 1977, a team of Rockwell International Engineers got together to study this space freighter design. It was going to be 100 metres long, 93 metres wide, and it would have carried about 90 tonnes to low Earth orbit. They anticipated it would need over 1,000 flights per year to support the Space Power System program. That would mean, like, one launch every eight hours. For this, it could actually operate from a regular runway. Uh, they would obviously need to supply the liquid hydrogen the engines needed, but other than that, they could operate anywhere in the world. And this was, of course, seen in it as an advantage because they could pick up hardware from airports all over the US, integrate it, and then take it to orbit. Now, for a launch to orbit, it would also have to be loaded with liquid oxygen, so that, plus the cargo, would bring its mass to about 2,000 tonnes. To get this much off the runway, they would have an extra set of landing gear, which would be attached and then dropped after takeoff, so that uh, that would then be recovered. Now, the jet engines, there were 10 of them, and they were basically magic. They, they would start out as turbojets and turned into with, with afterburners, they would switch mode and ultimately become ramjets, and they would work pr pr producing thrust all the way up to about Mach 6. And it reaches the speed of Mach 6 accelerating through a climb. So the launch trajectory had it reaching Mach 6 at about 29 kilometers of altitude. That's about 18 miles, about 100,000 feet. And by then, of course, the air does start to get thinner, and that's the point where they turn on the three main engines. These are hydrogen-oxygen rocket engines, and they generate a combined thrust of about 1,500 tons. Now, it's worth noting that the propellant for these jet engines is stored inside these very large wings, and they have diagrams of the exact tank design. Whereas the three uh, rocket engines they draw their propellant, their hydrogen, from inside the aircraft fuselage. So at this point, it's about Mach 7.2. It shuts down the jet engines and closes the air intakes for aerodynamics, and now it's entirely on rocket power. It's about one-third of the way to orbital velocity, so it has to keep firing that, lifting itself out of the atmosphere to an altitude of about 340 miles. Now, when the main engine's shut down, it isn't in a proper orbit. It has an apogee, which is well outside the atmosphere, but its perigee is still inside the atmosphere. So it cruises around for about another 45 minutes until it reaches apogee, and then circularizes the traje trajectory using a third set of engines. It had a pair of orbital maneuvering system engines, and these are presumably burning hypergolic propellants of some sort. Once in orbit, those orbital maneuvering thrusters would be used to rendezvous with its target and unload its cargo. So the cargo bay in the Star Raker was built into the main fuselage. Unlike the space shuttle, which had cargo bay doors on top, Rockwell felt that this was a point of structural weakness in the shuttle design, so they came up with a different design. The cargo's in the center fuselage, it's behind the cockpit here. The crew would move to the back of the crew compartment where they had windows that looked into the cargo bay, and then the entire nose would hinge around and move out of the way, providing access to the cargo. So this particular cargo, the mechanism, storage mechanism, wasn't particularly well detailed in the studies, but it was understood that if they were to dock with a structure, they would be doing it in this mode, 
So it's conceivable that a large amount of manoeuvring and docking would be carried out with the pilots essentially looking out their left window at the docking. So yeah, in this case, I've just got a single payload in there. We're going to slide it forwards and release it. And I'm just going to point out for the Kerbal players here, this is actually a separate craft file from the other object because I couldn't make them fly separately. The aerodynamics didn't work with the hinge and the, the nose kept on falling off. But in this case, yes, we have this beautiful little satellite being deployed. Uh, my design also has the cargo bay being significantly shorter just uh, because I messed up, to be honest. This hinged loading mechanism would of course be used on the ground and you can see several images where they have these planes, uh, Star Rikers essentially, rolled up with their nose inside a giant transparent clean room on the ground. So once the payload was deployed, they would fold the cockpit back into place and they would prepare for a return to Earth. By this point, they've obviously burned most of the propellant and based upon you know, interactions with NASA, it looks like the mass of the vehicle would about be about 330 metric tons without any propellant. Of course, at this point, they still have propellant on board because they have to perform the deorbit burn. And then they also have leftover hydrogen, which they're going to use for cross range when they get back into the atmosphere. Because of its large wings, it would actually have a much easier re-entry than the space shuttle. It was estimated that peak g-forces would be about 2.3 gravities because the wings were so large. For the thermal protection system, there were two options proposed. One was to use the low conductivity, uh, high temperature ceramic tiles that were used on the space station. The other was a metal heat shield where you would have sheets of metal with posts uh, you know, standing it out from the hull and inside the gap you would have thermal blankets inside. So in some of the low temperature areas they could get away with titanium aluminium, in other areas they would need something, well they describe it as a super alloy. Compared to the space shuttle, they had a higher lift to drag ratio, so they could get away with lower loads and lower temperatures. And by the time they were developing this, they had already developed the technology to actually do computer models, which weren't available in the early days of space shuttle development. Like the space shuttle, it would be a glider for most of re-entry. Uh, as it slowed down and became more aerodynamic, it would begin to use S-turns to control the energy and try to make sure it ends up near the launch site. But unlike the space shuttle, this had propellant left over and the engines were designed to come back online and help it reach whatever landing site it could. The designers had other plans for this uh, large cross-range capability. They envisaged early on that it would be able to take off from Florida and then instead of immediately going into orbit in a 28 degree inclination orbit, it would head south towards the equator for several hours until it was at zero latitude and then it would perform its takeoff into orbit. And that would leave the hardware in a zero degree inclination orbit. And this wouldn't actually help it launch that much more into orbit, but more importantly, since this was for a plan to put geostationary solar power satellites up there, it would mean that launching that hardware into geostationary orbit would have required less fuel, therefore they would have had to launch less hardware overall into orbit. But ultimately, after consultation with NASA, they decided to drop this plan. First of all, they tried to save it by reducing the mass of the aircraft at launch and then only loading liquid oxygen in flight at the equator. But uh, ultimately, they gave up on the whole idea and they decided everything would be launching into a 28 degree orbit. Either way, the whole thing was supposed to return to a runway and with minimal checkouts be able to be relaunched. They would land it, load the new hardware, attach the extra gear for the ground launch and then it would take off and head back to space and keep on doing this and building out solar power satellites in orbit. While this study was performed in 1978, they didn't envisage this whole thing ramping up and starting until like 2000 which is probably why they expected liquid hydrogen to be available at basically any air airport. But it also gave them two decades to solve their problems, like how to make their engines work all the way up to Mach 7 without melting due to the input air. Now, obviously the study never went anywhere. It was never translated into actual flying equipment, but the idea of the single stage to orbit 
space plane using multi-mode engines has never quite gone away. And right now, the best example is the Skylon, a space plane propelled by the Sabre engine, synergistic air-breathing rocket engine. A rocket engine that early in the flight can suck its air from the atmosphere, and then once it gets higher up, it can switch over to internal liquid oxygen and carry itself all the way to space. But I will have to talk about that in some detail some other time. For now, this was Star Raker. Thanks to David Portry for his work on documenting space history and giving me lots of stuff to read. Definitely check out his blog, you know, support him. And maybe we'll feature some more of his research in the future. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.